custom trays for the edentulous patient. So these, this is an actual patient of mine that I am treating in faculty practice. Um, she has a lot of resorption in this anterior premaxilla area. Uh, it's super flat, not a whole lot of attached tissue. On the mandible, she actually has no attached tissue in this area right here. It's just mucosa continuous. So the first thing I'm going to do is come in and mark these casts. So I'm going to start with the maxilla. And I'm going to go around this bleb right here, something I don't love. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of it. Uh, I'm going to just take it off. It's a little bit of an arbitrary area but my block out should take care of it. I just don't want my tray rocking around it. So on this patient who has severely resorbed bridges, it's really important that I don't overextend this denture, right? So the best way I can describe this, and I don't know if Dr. Pearson can catch me drawing this on the paper or not, but if I've got a situation that looks like this for the remaining ridge versus one that looks like this. Okay, so if I put a denture, and let's just draw a box. If I put a box that's the same size, right, because this patient has the same incisal edge position, the same occlusal plane as they would have, regardless of what the remaining ridge looks like. Okay, so if a patient has a lot of remaining ridge and it's tall and I have these parallel walls, if I come in and put force on this, this is going to resist movement of these walls and vice versa, this wall with this wall. Same denture, more resorption. When I put force here, this little angle, this non-parallel tapered wall with this same denture is not going to be very stable or retentive. Okay, so this is the situation that I'm dealing with here. I'm dealing with a patient that has not a very tall ridge, especially on the mandible. When we look at her mandible, it's flat, right? What's gonna resist that displacement? How is my denture going to be stable and retentive? I've got support, I've got support all day because I've got this buckle shelf and I've got the retromolar pads. I've got plenty of support. I've got the palate and the maxilla. It's flat, it's very flat. I've got a ton of support, but retention and stability are going to be an issue, okay? So let me go ahead and draw this for you. I do not want to overextend. So on this patient, I'm gonna err more on the four millimeter side of my custom tray from the depth of her vestibule. Okay. I'm gonna draw this. I was just talking to some of your classmates. I wanna make sure I extend all the way to the distal. She has some kind of some funny anatomy right here, so because I'm not sure at this point, I'm going to extend my tray all the way back to it. Come short. She's got a front of there. It's hard to see. Come up and around. And up here in the front, it's going to be hard. I'm going to just take it over the ridge but not down to the depth. It can't really be sh four millimeters shy of a zero millimeter vestibule. Okay, so there's my maxilla. I'm going to draw my palatal stop. And I'm going to make it pretty large on this patient because I can. Mm -hmm. This is actually a good example of a patient that I may do the stop because of this, these angles here and this kind of funny anatomy that she has, probably gonna make my stop in the center like the one in our lecture today where I don't actually extend it to the posterior border. Okay, so the first thing I wanna do is draw my lines. I'm happy with that. I'm gonna heat up my wax. Again, just heating it until it's kind of bending on its own. Heating my knife and cutting it. I'm gonna lay this wax gently over. And the more you do this, the better you'll get at knowing what size of wax you need, how much pressure to put on the wax to get it to adhere to the cast, etc. Once I'm happy with that, I'm going to come back and trim it away. 
you're going to see in a patient like this, my lines are much harder to adhere to because my reference is so much shorter. I don't have a lot of control over where I'm going. So I have to be more diligent coming back and readjusting until I'm happy. But if you notice how a warm blade will trim this wax very easily and without breaking it. Oh, a little bit. Okay, so I'm going to go shorter here. And maintaining all of the anatomy around that tuberosity. Okay. So length of this tray is different than, than height or depth. It's really important that I maintain this distance here so that I have the full length of the tray that I need. Okay, we're not just talking about depth when we're talking about this posterior border. Not just talking about the wall that is directly below this level down here, but talking about the area that extends beyond the level of the tray. So if I'm short here, that's a problem. Okay, if I'm short here, that's what I want. I want to be short here so I can add material back. I don't want to be trying to make my tray longer. I need my tray to support my material. I'm going to do a little bit more trimming. Like I said, I you can do this two ways. You can trim a lot ahead of time or you can trim after the fact. But what I want you to notice is how smooth this wax is. It's well adapted to the cast. You can see it's not very retentive, right? Let's, let's look at what the contours of her denture are going to look like. It's very short. Her palate is just as deep as her vestibule over here. It's almost equal, which means this is kind of just like a flat plate. It's got a couple of bumps underneath it, and that's it. Okay. So I'm going to come back and put in my stop. Again, because of that anatomy that she has, I'm going to modify my stop a little bit and not extend it completely distal through the posterior area. This is a little bit harder to do even with a warm knife just because this wax will get caught on itself. Have to be a little more diligent there. So I'm going to do a, a stop something like that. Doesn't have to be perfectly symmetrical or gorgeous or anything like that. Okay, it just needs to be functional. So I'm going to heat up my torch here just because I don't like how this area isn't as well adapted and it's rough. I'm going to come back and I'm going to smooth this point. My wick is a little high, keeping me from getting a good flame. There we go. So once I heat this up a little bit, I'm just going to heat it up everywhere and readapt it with my hand until I'm happy with it. So I'm happy with that one. Next step I'm going to do is tin foil. Okay. I want to make sure that it's well adapted so I start in the center, get my stop. I like to use a cotton roll to do this. Okay. And then, me personally, people do this differently. I like to wrap it around my cast. It just makes it more stable. Doesn't let that, keeps that wax in place for the times that it's not as sticky as I'd like it to be. Yeah, but what I want to see is I want to see all of these borders. I want to see the contours and surface area of the wax that I just did. Okay, so when you look at this, you can see the anatomy or the, the contours, that ledge of wax. You can see my stop. It's well adapted to the palette. Okay. I'm going to do some Vaseline. Just a thin layer. You don't need a lot. You want to be a little bit generous because if you do this step, you don't have to add Vaseline to the intaglio of it before you cure the inside if you've got good good Vaseline here. Okay. 
So you can see the difference in this type of tray versus the one that we did last week. You all, some of you have watched the demo. I've only used a half a piece of base plate wax and one piece of tin foil almost completely covers my cast. Okay, I don't have tall ridges, I don't have teeth, I don't have a deep palette, so my materials go a whole lot further. Okay, so this one piece of triad is going to get me a whole lot closer than what one piece of triad did for me before. So I'm really going to adapt this into that stop area and then holding it down as I roll it over the edge. Okay, we're going to have a lot of excess here and that's okay. I'm going to trim it away. So I like to use a 20 blade, trim around to the level of my wax, which I can see pretty well with this clear triad. It's not perfect, so I get close. I'm gonna save this for my tray handle. Yeah, I like to go ahead and just hide it under that so it stays pretty well covered. I got a piece of wax in there I wanna get rid of. That doesn't wanna stay, so I'm gonna put it on that. Okay, so I'm looking at my my borders. I'm gonna kind of come in again. Water on your fingertip is good. Helps to keep this from cracking and helps it to blend a little bit better. And I'm shaping this around the border that I made with that wax. So I'm being a little bit more technical with this one than I was with the one with teeth okay because now I don't I really have to take this to a patient and use it on my patient so you can see I'm spending a little more time adapting these borders coming around and verifying that it is at the length that I want it because I don't really want to do a ton of trimming on this I'm making this master impression on this patient tomorrow during my faculty practice time and I don't want to spend 30 minutes adjusting it now or then so i'm going to get it really close i'm happy with that okay this particular patient has no no bone in this area so i'm going to make a modified type of impression remember in lecture i said make sure you design your tray for the type of impression that you plan to take or make okay so i'm going to make a combination impression where i do a passive impression in this area with light body and then medium or heavy body everywhere else. I need to have access to this area. Okay, so this isn't doesn't have to make sense to you right now. I'm gonna we're gonna try to actually uh, record the act of this impression so that it'll make more sense. But if I put my handle right here, it's gonna be in my way. So for this particular patient, I'm gonna modify the handle and I'm gonna bring it back and put two little handles here to grab onto. Okay, again, just making my, my tray functional with the type of impression I'm gonna make. And really this is just so I have something to grab onto when I try to pull this. And I'm gonna extend it down a little bit in that front area because I want some support. Y'all see where that's gonna get thin, right? It's got it's just a thinner area doesn't have a lot of support so i'm gonna bring my handle something like this and do a little bit more again i want to make sure that this handle doesn't interfere with my border molding movements so I'm just adding this for stability and thickness. And then I'm gonna come back and shape this to the size that I want it. I'm gonna put a little Vaseline on my finger since I don't have water here. It's really weird to hear my voice going on another video right now. <laughs> It's fine, it just seems weird. All right. 
So this is gonna just give me a little bit of freedom to work in that area and the pre-maxilla without having to worry a whole lot about that tray breaking in that area. And I'm just doing a really well adapted tray handle. I want this to look nice, right? My patient's gonna see this. It's gonna go in their mouth. I don't want to design something that that doesn't look professional. So I blend the borders really well. Again, function is the most important thing, okay? Some of us like to have dinner parties and we say presentation is just as important as the food, right? I'm one of those people, I don't know about you, but I like to be creative and make things look maybe fancier than they are, but but this just looks nice and gives your patient some confidence in your, your ability to, to be professional and make something that looks nice. So we're gonna put this in the triad machine.